everyone, welcome to Old News, where the fossils are old but discoveries are new. My name is Laura Beth, I will be your host, and I will be keeping an eye on our chat to make sure that I don't miss any questions or comments from you guys. And of course we have the one, the only, Dr. Christian Kammerer here with us today to share the news. So hey Christian. Hey Laura Beth, good hey. to see you, happy to be here. Yeah, I'm super excited to learn about the dinosaurs of darkness. Um, before we dive into our topic, though, I do want to remind everyone that um, we're doing something a little bit different today. So um, to celebrate the end of a wonderful season of old news, we're going to be giving away old newsies. So we're going to have a very silly award ceremony at the end of the program. Um, many of you voted for your favorite creatures that we've talked about over the past year. So stick around to the end um, to find out who won. And yeah, and I, I do not know the winners, so it'll be a surprise for me as well. There could be some real upsets in the mix. <laughs> yeah, it, it could be. I, I'll try not to give anything away right now. <laughs> um, but before we get to that, uh, talking about the sort of the, the latest from the world of paleontology. Um, so a lot of times uh, on this program, we talk about uh, new discoveries in the sense of newly discovered species or newly discovered fossils. Um, but a lot of the progress being made in paleontology today is also uh, sort of new data using new techniques and new methods on previously known fossils. Um, and so today is, a, I think, a good example of that, uh, getting at the what we would call paleobiology. So not just uh, sort of the geological aspects of paleontology or just the strict anatomical aspects of paleontology, but trying to understand how prehistoric creatures lived as sort of, you know, you know, breathing animals of their day uh, using sort of the suite of tools uh, available to modern scientists. Um, so to jump in, we're going to be talking about that with some Cretaceous dinosaurs. And so these are, all right. Um, so these are animals that are living in the, the last of the periods of the Mesozoic era. Uh, and the ones in particular that we're going to be focusing on today are dinosaurs that were found in the Gobi Desert in the country of Mongolia. Um, so last month we were talking about some of the amazing fossil discoveries in northeastern China. Um, we're moving west of there now to another really, you know, amazing and historically, uh, you know, heavily studied uh, fossil bearing area in the Gobi. Um, so the most famous of these localities is what is usually called in English as the Flaming Cliffs uh, for probably obvious reasons. They have these really spectacular sandstone outcrops that are sort of deep orange, even verging on red out there. Uh, and these rocks have revealed a really diverse and incredibly well-preserved array of late Cretaceous um, mammals, lizards, uh, all sorts of other reptiles, but especially dinosaurs. Um, so these are in the mostly in the Campanian, which is part of the late Cretaceous, more or less 75 million years ago or so. And the first sort of uh, major discoveries were made there in back, back in the 1920s as part of the, the Central Asiatic expeditions of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, but has subsequently been studied by a you know, wide range of paleontologists from Mongolia, from Poland, from Russia, from Japan, um, really you know, tons and tons of fossils out there. Uh, so the, the most famous of the initial discoveries there uh, were the first dinosaur eggs and nests, which were historically attributed to the most common of the dinosaurs found out there, which is Protoceratops. This is a small-ish frilled dinosaur um, an earlier relative of the giant horned dinosaurs, things like Triceratops or Styracosaurus, you might be familiar with uh, from the latest Cretaceous of North America. Um, so these images, like this one by uh, Charles Knight showing Protoceratops on their nests, was really iconic uh, depiction of these Gobi dinosaurs for, for many years. Um, interestingly, though, there was a, a theropod dinosaur, a meat-eating dinosaur, found associated with these nests back in the 20s that was named Oviraptor, the egg thief, as this was interpreted as having snuck in and 
malevolently purloined uh, the baby protoceratopsis. Um, it was not until much later in more recent expeditions that more oviraptorids, relatives of oviraptor were found uh, actually sitting on the nest and embryos were found in these eggs, which turn out to be oviraptor embryos. So this was not the egg thief at all, rather this was the mother of these eggs. And so it was sort of got a bad rap for 70 odd years of being thought of as this egg thieving animal when in fact it was, it was guarding its own nest. Um, there are real protoceratops eggs and babies also known, but the sort of the classic egg shape uh, traditionally attributed to protoceratops is actually from from oviraptorus or dinosaurs. Um, so an example of how our understanding of paleobiology advances with new discoveries there. Um, no, another uh, protoceratops specimen of note, maybe one of the most spectacular dinosaur specimens of all time. This was collected in the, the Polish expeditions in the 1970s, uh, the so-called fighting dinosaurs. So this is a complete protoceratops skeleton uh, seemingly locked in mortal combat uh, with fatal results for both parties with the, the famous sickle-clawed predator Velociraptor, um, with the Velociraptor's sort of claws still embedded in the, the protoceratops, uh, and there's damage to the Velociraptor skeleton, suggesting that it was maybe had part of its uh, chest bashed in by the, the powerful beak of the herbivore here. Um, so very rarely do we actually see behavior like this um, actually preserved in the fossil record. There's lots of speculation in paleontology, uh, lots of inferences based on reasonable data, which is something we'll be talking about with, with the news uh, this month. Uh, but very, very rarely are behaviors preserved as fossils. Uh, so this is really rare and incredible example of that in the fighting dinosaurs. Um, and these animals, Protoceratops and Velociraptor, as I mentioned before, they've been known since the 1920s um, and you know, are some of the, the more famous dinosaurs out there. Uh, but more recent expeditions to the Gobi have revealed sort of new and bizarre dinosaur groups um, previously unknown. Uh, one example of which, which is the, the group we're going to be focusing on uh, for this old news, um, was first represented by this animal Mononychus, uh, which was described based on uh, partial skeletons uh, collected in the, the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and this is a sort of a small, maybe turkey-sized dinosaur, uh, vaguely ostrich-like in its proportions, one might say, sort of typical theropod, long-legged, long-neck uh, type situation. Um, but very strange arms to this thing. Hence, so the name Mononychus in Greek means uh, one claw. And so it's a member of this group, uh, which is now turned out to be quite diverse. Uh, a lot of different species have been found called the Alvarez saurids. Um, and so as you can see in the specimen on the left, which is a, an Alvarez saurid from Patagonia, the aptly named uh, Patagonychus, um, the arms are actually quite short and they have this one really big claw on it. Uh, so this is shown the evolution of this in the, the figure on the top right there, where sort of the, the primitive condition is down at the bottom, which is for these theropods to have three big fingers. And then in the early Alvarez sores, one of the, the digits is becoming thickened and enlarged. And then in the later ones, uh, the, the single digit has basically become the entirety of the hand. So in some of these like Shavuya uh, at top, which is the taxon we'll be discussing in, in further detail in just a bit, uh, there still are these tiny little fingers associated with it, but it's mostly just that one, one really big finger. And in some of them like uh, Linhainicus monodactylus um, from North China, uh, it seems like there really is only a single finger left. So very, very strange morphology uh, where you have these very, very short arms, uh, yet very powerfully muscled and with these big and robust single claws. Um, so not really something that looks like anything alive today. And even though there are plenty of theropods that did limb reduction convergently, so T-Rex, obviously the most famous one, um, but also things like Carnotaurus and the other abelosaurs in South America also had greatly reduced forelimbs. 
Um, but even compared to those, this is a very strange and unique uh, morphology of just having these these single little little stub arms. Um, and so this has, you know, since Mononychus's description in the 90s, uh, scientists have been speculating and arguing over how these animals were living, like what was their paleobiology, what were they using these arms for, um, and sort of a lot of back and forth on that. Uh, but it still has, you know, a lot of aspects of how they were living has remained mysterious. Um, and so this is where the new research comes in, uh, which is is using uh, some of the aspects of the cranial morphology, sort of of the skull and sense organs of these animals to figure out how they were living. Um, and especially this has been based on some really spectacular Alvarez Sorid discoveries from the Gobi, like the specimen of Shivuya here. So this is one of these uh, better known taxa, probably the best known skull of any of these animals. Um, so you can see sort of the, the ribs to the left there and then this long uh, neck of uh, the cervical vertebrae and then the skull to the right. And you're looking down, uh, top down onto it. Uh, so it's a bit squashed and you can see the sort of the eyeballs on each side. Um, but for the most part, an intact and really, really well-preserved skull. Um, and so within one of the eye sockets there, you might be able to see a mass of little little bones. Uh, and that is the basis for a lot of these, these inferences on how these animals were living. Uh, so those are what are called sclerotic ossicles. Uh, so this is something that I think we've talked about on old news before. These are actual bones inside the eyeball. Uh, so if you look at the skull of really most vertebrates. So mammals like ourselves are unusual in lacking the sclerotic ring. Like you might think what, like your eyeball being full of bones, that seems weird. Um, but actually it's lacking eyeball bones. That's weird for a vertebrate. Uh, most of them have it. So if you look in this uh, figure here, uh, there are two lizard species on the left. You can see the rings that are labeled SR. That's the sclerotic ring. Um, the specimens on the right actually are Proto mammals, so they include sort of some of our ancestors in these synapsids. So even our own ancestors had sclerotic rings, uh, and mammals just lost them through time. Um, so why is this important for understanding behavior? Well, the sclerotic rings they serve a lot of purposes. Uh, they strengthen the eye. They can help uh, with more refined eye musculature. Uh, some like very deep diving vertebrates, you know, they help support the eye against pressure. Um, but from a, from a uh, behavioral inference perspective, uh, if we look at the uh, sclerotic ring in the eye, um, it surrounds the lens and sort of like the maximal extent of the pupil of the eye. And so this the, determines basically how much light the eye is specialized for. So there are two types of basic types of eye here. Uh, the one on the top is labeled scotopic and the bottom one on the bottom is labeled photopic. Uh, so a photopic eye uh, is specialized for taking in lots of light. So very bright conditions is how these animals see. And that can be recognized by a relatively small sclerotic ring, uh, a relatively small aperture for the eye uh, relative to the eye socket size. Whereas the scotopic animal, this is taking in, trying to take in as much light as possible because it lives in very dark, very low light environment. Um, and so it has very, very big aperture there. The sclerotic ring is very large relative to the eye socket size. Um, so there are a lot of reasons why something might be living in low light environments. Um, it could be living in a cave, it could be living under bark or something, but for the most part, uh, this can be used to infer whether an animal is diurnal, that is living during the day, or active during the day rather, or nocturnal, primarily active at night. Um, so this is, you know, it's a it's a continuum uh, of that. There are animals that are active basically all the time. Um, there are animals that can sort of shift from being active in the day to active in the night. Um, it's this is not hard and fast, but on very rough level, uh, this is fairly good for telling you whether this was a a day dwelling or a night dwelling animal. Um, and so this has been applied quite a bit, this uh, looking at sclerotic ring dimensions in fossil taxa. Uh, but recently there was this paper that just came out last week uh, looking most broadly at uh, sclerotic rings in dinosaurs, birds, and some other 
fossil reptiles. So if you look, there's a there's a graph to the left showing all of these different species based on uh, ring dimensions, and then to the right you can see what the the colored circles there in the skull, those are the sclerotic rings relative to the orbit size. So on the top, you have a, a bird and then a non-avian dinosaur with very big sclerotic rings relative to the orbit, suggesting that these animals were nocturnal. And then on the bottom, ones with much smaller sclerotic rings, suggesting that they were, were diurnal. Um, and so the, the position of the Alvarez sores, things like Shavuya in this uh, is very interesting because they occupy a fairly extreme position in the nocturnal side of things. So they have proportionally gigantic sclerotic rings relative to the eyes. Uh, and that's not the only sort of sense organ uh, that these, these authors looked at. So actually from, from a different paper, but published at, at the exact same time, uh, looking at uh, the inner ear. So this is the part, uh, the innermost part of the ear that actually has, it's surrounded by bone. So we can see it in fossils by using uh, computed tomography, that is CT scans, a series of x-rays of the skull, uh, allowing us to reconstruct internal features that are not visible uh, from the outside of the skull. So looking at the shape of this inner ear and particularly these, these semicircular canals. And so like in the inner ear today, you have things like, like the cochlea, this is even beyond the eardrum deep in the skull. Um, and these are very important for, for balance and some of the finer acoustic properties of hearing. Um, and something that you can see from the, the ear morphology, the shape of these things in all of these different uh, dinosaurs and some birds um, and some earlier reptiles, is that a lot of them are very similar in shape. So there's a lot of conservation of form uh, in these uh, otic labyrinths. Uh, but there is a weird outlier. Uh, the bottom left, which is that Alvarez saurid Shavuya, is quite different in shape from most of the other dinosaur, non-avian dinosaurs and the bird being sampled there. And so what's interesting is that this shape is not unique uh, among dinosaurs and their descendants, the birds. It's actually very similar uh, to what we see in modern owls. So both the Sort of the proportions of the semicircular canals and also this uh, this endosseous uh, cochlear duct, the lagena coming down from it uh, is, is very, very similar to the exclusion of most of other living birds and extinct dinosaurs. Uh, so this does seem to be convergence towards the you know similar selective forces in these animals' lives. Uh, so it's, it's what's suggesting the combination of these uh, really nocturnally adapted eyeballs and then also very owl-like ears indicate that these uh, Alvarez saurids are, are doing something quite different from most dinosaurs we think of. Um, that these animals probably were, were highly specialized nocturnal predators um, utilizing both, uh, you know, fairly uh, specialized vi uh, night vision and then also very, uh, specialized hearing in order to find uh, all sorts of small prey. So it could, could be small vertebrates, uh, flying insects, and you know just being able to track them down in the, the desert landscapes that it called home around 75 million years ago. Now, how do the, the super robust but tiny arms work into this? Um, well, the, I mean, it was clearly using them for something. You wouldn't maintain such powerful muscles and such a big claw if they were being lost entirely. Um, and so uh, what the authors are arguing in, in keeping with some other uh, previous arguments as to Alvarez sword paleobiology is that these were being used for digging either through the, you know, the sediment or maybe more likely given their position high on the body for uh, to pull apart things like rotting logs or tree bark uh, too. So they have excellent hearing, excellent night vision uh, if you pull open, you know, some of these, uh, you know, barks that are full of insects and being able to hunt them down, maybe something like, you know, the, the lemur, the eye of Madagascar today, which sort of chews through bark and listens for, for grubs and insects under there. Um, but, you know, still a very a sort of strange morphology. And so it, it's coming at this uh, ecology differently from, from any of the animals that we know today, even though it is doing a lot of things similarly.
Man. So, um, all right, everyone, don't forget that you can type into the chat to ask your questions. I have to say that I didn't know that, you know, that the arms could get any shorter than they do on like a T-Rex. I mean, that's yeah, it's crazy. wild. Do you think that, um, so you said you think it might've been like digging or kind of like scraping through, um, bark, mm -hmm. right? So do you think it would have been going at it from the side, like a tree from the side, or do you think it would have been going like down into like a stump or do you, we not know? I mean, it's, it's really hard to say. Uh, it's even unclear how, how much of sort of a forest system there was in this ecosystem. So, cause it is, it's very, you know, the Gobi is a desert today and it hasn't always been a desert, but the amount of sandstone that these are in suggests that there were sand dunes there even at the time that this was a, a paleo desert as well. Um, with that said, there were certainly, you know, the paleo botanical records indicate that there are a lot of plants there. Uh, there were certainly would have been oasis systems and delta systems that could have supported larger plant life, things like trees. Um, so with the with the body shape of these Alvarez saurids, uh, it seems like it would have been awkward for them to like get because they have these super long legs, but these super short arms. So actually getting down to the ground itself and digging there seems like it would be difficult. Um, but something like a log or sort of the base of a tree or a stump, it, it makes more sense. Um, yeah. But, you know, we don't have any 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 direct fossilized evidence of, you know, sort of scrape marks on on a fossil piece of petrified wood or something like that. Yeah. And I imagine that'd be pretty hard to, um, you know, to connect to a creature. Right. Yeah. Anyway, if you found those kinds of signs and you answered my other question about how we even knew that it was a desert at the time that um, that these guys were living there. So we have a question from the chat. Sam wanted to know, what are the advantages to hunting during the night? It seems like much more work than hunting during the day. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it can be. You have to invest in, you know, sort of these these specialized sense organs uh, to be able to see light when it's mostly dark. Um, but yeah, there are definite advantages. One, from a perspective as a predator, uh, a lot of insects are only active at dark. So if you're an insectivore, these things that are living under leaves or under bark during the day might be coming out to to mate or to drink nectar or something like that. So that's the time to strike. Um, also, these are fairly small animals, like these Alvarez saurids are, are quite tiny by dinosaur standards. Um, so they have to be thinking as prey as well. Uh, and you know, you have some large predators that are more active during the day uh, that might be hunting some of these these big herbivores that are mostly, mostly diurnal, but also can sort of verge on uh, being awake all the time, just because they have to be eating constantly. Um, but there's there's a chance that, you know, you might be better off uh, being able to escape potential predators at night. Uh, another thing to consider is thermoregulation. So maintaining uh, a safe range of, of body heat. So in the desert, you know, it we don't know the exact temperature. We do know the world was generally pretty hot during the Cretaceous. So Cretaceous deserts were probably quite warm indeed. And as a little thing, maybe uh, you don't want to get baked too much crawling around on sand dunes during the day. Uh, and instead, it's a lot lot safer to be out at night there. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of different options. Okay, so follow up questions to that. Um, what do you think it was doing during the day to, you know, hide from the heat to get away from the heat? Um, and also, how do you think it would have protected itself from a predator? And do you have any idea what would have been trying to eat it? And you said it's the size of a turkey, right? Yeah, or or smaller. Like that's the biggest Alvarez swords are only around turkey sized. I mean, some okay. of these really are. They are quite tiny. Um, so potential predators, you have uh, dromaeosaurs in this ecosystem. So things like Velociraptor and its relatives, uh, definite concerns. Um, there are like, if you're thinking about the really big predators, there are uh, there's limited evidence of sort of like large sort of carnosaur type animals. Um, there are relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex that appear somewhat later uh, in in the Gobi series, uh, but certainly that we know Alvarez saurs and Tyrannosaurs coexisted at least part of their, their history. There are a few Alvarez saurs from Western North America as well that would have been coexisting with, with T-Rex proper. Um, 
but you know probably these animals were sort of too small to really be worth the attention of at least an adult tyrannosaur right um and sorry what was the other question <laughs> sorry um yeah so how would they escape the heat during the day oh yeah um so really difficult to say you know if you look at desert animals today uh some of it is just like finding a bush and curling up underneath it uh if these animals were were digging at all you know they could it's even though the forelimbs were very specialized for digging that doesn't rule out them being able to do some scratch digging with the hind limbs um so there's no evidence that these animals were living in dens uh but we can't rule it out either uh like a lot of a lot of animals that are not specialized burrowers so we talked about the indicators of being like a specialized fossorial animal last month but those are things that are like are underground all the time when you look at things today like warthogs or like foxes that you know they spend every night in a den but they don't have the anatomical specializations as the burrower um so there's no reason some of these Alvarez swords couldn't at least put together a little den for themselves as well and then you know come out at night that thought is really adorable to me <laughs> yeah just these you know little so cute stove armed turkey beasts uh in their nests down there <laughs> Um, and Sam and I were talking in the chat about barred owls. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we hear them all, a lot around here in Raleigh, North Carolina, or around Raleigh. Um, the, they do the hoo 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 hoo. Mm -hmm. So do we think, do we have any idea what these guys would have sounded like or how they would have communicated with each other? Do we think they may have, may have sounded like owls? So it's difficult to say. Uh, so in we know that non-avian dinosaurs couldn't sing like modern perching birds because they utilize a very specialized organ called the syrinx in the throat uh, that was not present it had not evolved yet in these these earlier dinosaurs mm -hmm. um but as you know not all birds use that to communicate uh and so certainly there's an array of vocalizations that the non-avian dinosaurs could have used um it's one of those things where it's that really is even in an age when we're learning so much about their biology and even what colors some of these dinosaurs were figuring out what they sounded like is probably a bridge too far and going beyond anything but but speculation um, but it's reasonable to think you know that they were extremely diverse in their vocalizations and for these carnivorous dinosaurs could have been everything from kind of an alligator like bellow to clacking their beak tips together to having maybe some more bird-like calls. Um, we you know that since these Alvarez saurids, their, their hearing was, was so good. Um, and presumably that's mostly for, for hunting prey as it is for owls. Uh, but, you know, that could also mean that, you know, they were communicating with each other at a, at a fairly advanced level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Owls can hunt, like I know they have really good eyesight, but can't they hunt even just by hearing if they- Yes, so they actually have the, the way the feathers are arranged, like the facial disc that is characteristic of owls, um, which we wouldn't know existed at just based on the bones, by the way. Like if you look at a, a de-feathered owl, it's a very, very weird looking thing. Um, very sort of scrawny type of beast. Um, but yeah, a lot of the owl's head is evolved towards sort of like focusing sound waves and being able to uh, really pinpoint the positions of mostly quite fast moving and evasive nocturnal prey like like rodents and for some of the smaller owls, insects as well. Right. Wow. Um... Oh, and Anne wants to know, what sound does an ostrich or an emu make? So, uh, like, a lot of their vocalizations are, you know, related to, to beak clacking and then also just sort of, like, scratching on the ground. You know, they can make some noises with the throat, uh, but it would be difficult for me to really reproduce those <laughs> right here. I mean, I don't have you the... You clack your beak? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have the the jaw structures uh required for it yeah 
Man, if I could have any superpower, I think it would be to be able to talk to animals and just mm -hmm. understand whatever, you know, language they're using <laughs> and, um, and, re and repeat it. And Sam says that now they're imagining Shibuya with a feathered facial disc. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's not impossible. Um, certainly given the other similarities to owls, something, uh, and again, you know, these are, these are very bird-like dinosaurs. Uh, Mononychus actually was originally described as a, as an early bird rather than a non-avian dinosaur. Now the line has become so blurred that it's kind of meaningless, but they're, they're somewhere close to, to birds. Um, so they were, you know, they would have been feathered. Um, and some, some sort of, uh, feathering that would have further improved their already keen eyesight and hearing uh, makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, would feathers, as we know them, would they have existed at that oh. point in time? Oh yeah, so this is, this is the latest Cretaceous. So we know from the, the Liaoning finds and you know, comparable finds like Archaeopteryx in Germany from the late Jurassic that feathers go way back uh, into the Jurassic at least, and probably into the Triassic uh, to the, uh, the origin of all the major dinosaur groups, if not all the way down to the, the split between dinosaurs and pterosaurs. Mm -hmm. So yeah, feathers had been evolving for, for a good long time by the time the Alvarezsaurids came on the scene. Yeah. All right, well, um, oh, okay. Um, Tom wants to know, what is the largest dinosaur known with feathers? So the biggest one that had what we would call feathers is probably Utyrannus, um, which is a large carnivorous dinosaur from, from Liaoning as well, um, which is, get it, it's not, you know, it's not T-Rex size, um, but it's getting into sort of like the 30 foot range. So okay. there is- Massive. There's, there's another, not quite as big, um, but there's uh, a Therizinosaur called Bipiaosaurus um, from the same deposits that all also had like very noticeable big shaggy feathers. So animals bigger than that, we don't really know. So there are dinosaurs larger than that that we, we're fairly confident did not have feathers. Um, so duckbill dinosaurs very frequently are preserved with skin impressions, um, things like Corythosaurus, uh, Edmontosaurus, uh, Paraterolophus, those sorts of animals um, have these polygonal scales covering their whole body and seem to have been totally unfeathered. Um, the horned dinosaurs, some of the early ones, their early relatives like Cetacosaurus had these quills on the tail, um, but otherwise- Porcupine? Well, it's somewhat like the African crested porcupine, but more just kind of like this cascade of elongate quills just on the tip of the tail. So probably more for display than any any kind of defense. Um, but the later horned dinosaurs, there's little is known. We don't have a complete sort of skin impression, but it seems like they were just scaly, um, not feathery. And all the super giant dinosaurs, the long neck sauropods, uh, what what is known of them suggests that they were they were all totally scaly. Um, the big question is Still, whether the big theropods, so animals that we know are come from a history of like being very heavily feathered, uh, were were feathery. So, like, was Tyrannosaurus rex covered with feathers? And the the jury is still out on that. So, the there are very very few skin impressions of T. Rex or any of the bigger Tyrannosaurus, things like Tarbosaurus, Despletosaurus. Um, what impressions we have are just scales. We haven't found any feathers yet. And some scientists have argued that, you know, these are giant animals living in a, a fairly hot time in Earth's history. So if you look at things comparable in size or larger among mammals, so we're looking at elephants, they've lost most of their hair uh, because they'd be they'd overheat on the sort of like the, the plains of the Serengeti if they were totally covered with fur. Um, so the argument has been put forth that an animal Tyrannosaurus's size would have, even if it came from feathered ancestors, which we know it did, uh, it may have lost the feathers uh, and had this sort of naked scaly skin for thermoregulation. Um, but, you know, there are, it is, it's not clear if that it is always the case. Like we have a very limited viewpoint of sort of like what 
big animals are still alive today just because so much of the megafauna was wiped out in the past 10,000 years um, to really say that that always holds that, you know, if you're big, you have to lose your feathers or fuzz or fur or whatever it is. So the possibility that T-Rex may have been feathery uh, had, can't rule it out yet. I think uh, regardless when they were born, they like the T-Rex chicks were probably downy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had an episode about that, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and by the way, our friend in the chat, Dylan, was reading your mind and asking about quills right before you started talking about them. Um, <laughs> so I think we've gotten all of our questions answered. If not, we'll we'll go back to some of those questions. But, you know, we promised you some old newsies silly awards. So we're going to go ahead and um, announce our winners. I'm very excited. <laughs> and thank you so much to everyone who voted. If you didn't get a chance to vote on anything yet, um, I'll save I'll save one for, for you guys at the end. All right. So welcome to the old newsies. <laughs> oh, my horn broke. That was supposed to be a really <laughs> um, formal way of announcing the award ceremony. So let me try one more time. All right, it's just broken. So welcome to the old newsies. Uh, moving right along, um, we are going to go with our first category, which was the best smile. Aww. And these were the top two contenders, the uh, Minginia, which was like a giant um, armored fish. But armored, and... that one's not giant. That one is pretty small. Oh, this one was pretty small? Yeah. How small? Um, so this is, you know, maybe the size like a salmon. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but it is, it is, it's a member of this group, the Placoderms, um, that included giant things like Dunkleosteus. So where you could be getting 20, 30 foot long predatory fish. That's um, but yeah, the fossil of Minginia itself is like, it's like this. Oh, um, okay. Well, I'm glad you corrected me because I must've just been thinking of Dunkleosteus. Mm -hmm. By far the most famous me. of the Placoderms. So <laughs> makes sense. Uh, either way, great smile there, I think. Um, but then, of course, it's up against the saber tooth cats. Yeah. <laughs> Smile it on. So, um, feel Smile's free. Smile's in the name. How are you going to be I that? Know. It is. And that literally does mean smile, right? In the name? No. So, it's actually, so it's ancient Greek. Um, Smilodon means like blade tooth, like sword tooth. Okay. Great name. Um, so, Oh, Jackson voted for Smilodon. So Thank you, let's see. Uh, feel free to throw into the chat um, what you voted for or what you would vote for. Of course, you know, the votes for this one have been tallied. And Smilodon won. So yay, Smilodon. Yeah. I mean, it's an honor just to be nominated, but <laughs> it seems difficult to beat Smilodon for best smile. Christian, can you um, give like mini speeches for each <laughs> animal? <laughs> I'm just uh, kidding, but also if, that. if it comes to you, that would just be great. Um, all right, so second category is best name, and we had two front runners. We had Falcatacali. Did I say that right? No. Uh, Falcatacali. Okay. Opposite bird. That's a, that's what its name means. And then Skibalonyx scapter, also well, for, known. For, for the first one, the it's it's a member of the group that an antiornithines and that means opposite bird uh falcata Kaley itself means like little blade in reference to its beak shape which is actually a pretty cool name like that sounds like a kind of dark superhero's mm -hmm. nickname or at like... least the kid sidekick of a dark superhero little, <laughs> yeah. little blade there's big blade and little blade yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, that's really adorable. We should write a movie. <laughs> um, oh my gosh. I'll get Marvel on the line. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, all right. So we've got Dung Digger versus Little Blade or Opposite Bird, which was the name of the group, mm -hmm. right? So the winner was Dung Digger, mm -hmm. which of course is an excellent name. Um, Best and worst name, right? <laughs> like, I don't know if I'd want to have that name. Yeah, hard to live it down. <laughs> oh, and Sam um, was working on an, on an acceptance speech for us for Smilodon. 
She said, thank you. I polished my canines just for this award ceremony. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, most huggable. This one was really, really close. Um, so we've got Philocomus, which was our social mammal, right? So in this picture, there were about five or six of them all mm -hmm. huddled together. Um, and then there's Sinomacrops, which um, looks like a porg from Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I have a feeling that's where a lot of the votes were coming from. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what would you vote for, Christian? Um, I think I got to go with Sinomacrops on this one. Well, guess what? That is yeah. the <laughs> Macrops. Most huggable. The, the, Those, the big eyes like that. How You know, you got to love it. It's like an emoji. <laughs> <laughs> um awesome so congratulations to sino macros and that was from the episode we did last month yeah the late late jurassic of china yeah the lager right mm -hmm. yeah all right so opposite perhaps of most huggable was most likely to give you nightmares <laughs> and um conpengopterus I, I should have noted sizes in this um, this uh, document that was kind of like a cheat sheet so that you all could see the pictures because wasn't this one actually pretty small, Christian? Yeah, it's it's certainly a good deal bigger than Sinomacrops, but still, you know, we look in maximally like a three foot wingspan or, or thereabouts. I mean, that's three feet. It's pretty big. Um, and that face is pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. Looks like something from, it reminds real, me of a uh, Beetlejuice. Real proper pterodactyl face there. <laughs> yeah. And then of course we have Smilodon, which, um, yeah, blade tooth. I mean, Spicer itself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a it's a giant, it's saber tooth tiger that we know lived with and probably did hunt humans uh, <laughs> in, our, in our own deep history, so. That would be the logical. Yeah. Um, so which one would you choose, Christian? I mean, Smiling On is the one that would hunt and kill me. So I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna go with that. Ah, Smile got on. it. That was the winner. Congratulations, Smiling On. At least I would get to enjoy that great smile immediately before I die. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Jackson said, but the teeth on Dactyl. Yeah, those teeth were crazy, but not crazy enough, apparently. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so moving on, we had most likely to succeed, and this is, of course, if they weren't already extinct, right? Yeah, Smilodon really cl cleaning up on these. I know, that's what I was thinking. Smilodon has been doing really, really well. I mean, it's an iconic taxon. Uh, yeah, and I think that, you know, it makes sense. I mean, there are a lot of big cats around today that are mm -hmm. really successful. There are feral cats that are so successful that they're actually invasive. Yeah. Right. So um, no, no I think problem. that makes sense to choose. But we had one of our friends actually made a comment about Philocomus, and they said that they thought that since it was social and it was like living with its family and friends, that maybe it had that more of a support system. So, you know, that would have helped it become more successful. So I really liked that. And ultimately, Philocomus was the winner. Yeah, I love it. That's so, also, that's what I would choose just that, because... You know, multi-tuberculates, they are, they are not alive today, but that doesn't mean they weren't a successful group. They uh, were one of the few sort of major vertebrate groups that survived the uh, mass extinction between the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic. So they went on into the Paleocene and the Eocene, um, and they had an in incredibly uh, sort of diverse and successful run in, in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. So that's, you know, tens of millions of years more more than cats have <laughs> wow gosh i can't even imagine that amount of time i know i probably say that at least every other month but <laughs> it's it's true um and i also feel like we should be playing like destiny's child survivor right now <laughs> for these guys copyright claim anyway moving right along to our last category um was people's choice so this was just overall what was your favorite and we had it narrowed down to two we had smilodon which apparently we've learned is really really popular mm -hmm. and then we had mobosaurus so for this one we were still tied and um so i was thinking you guys could maybe type into the chat 
and let us know which one you would choose today. And maybe we can use that as a tiebreaker. And I would ask Christian to be a tiebreaker, but Christian, and I'll admit I'm also biased. We're both biased because Mabasaurus, just to remind you all from our dragons um, episode, that is the one that Christian actually described. So <laughs> not trying to create any bias in you guys. But, but if you um, want to vote for one, I mean, I'd say the choice is pretty obvious. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll give you... Okay, we've got one vote for Mobasaurus. All right, done. <laughs> I mean, oh, Jackson said Smilodon, but Jackson, okay. I, I know you already voted because you admitted it. <laughs> no double votes. Oh, we have another for Mobasaurus. And Dylan adds that they love that nody little dude. <laughs> <laughs> are some nodes. Yeah. Oh, another for Smilodon. So maybe, mm-hmm. well, are we tied? I think we're. I think my bosser is still one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm coming yeah, down. They can on be tied I'm in your heart. Tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna go with my as the winner. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Sam uh, said it looks like it has its built-in party hats. It's a good. Yeah, party. right. <laughs> it's here to celebrate. Okay, and another for Smilodon. Well, okay, so they're tied. Um, they were both awesome, right? Awesome episodes and awesome creatures. Um, so that was it for our old newsies. And let's all give a, a warm round of applause to our, our winners for today. I would try my party horn, but we know what will happen there. Um, and also, I did want to add that... Um, We had someone suggest that we do the most intelligent category. And I was also thinking we should have like a most bizarre category. So Christian, maybe just in a, in a sentence, like who would you choose for most intelligent if you had to, if you could remember? Yeah. uh, I think intelligence is very difficult to quantify in any circumstance uh, and certainly in fossil organisms as well. Uh, I would like to make the case for that. Shavuya and the Alvarez Swords that we talked about just today uh, in terms of at least having a very, very complex sensory system and very complicated brains as well for the sort of predation that they were doing. Um, Not bigger brains than something like most mammals, uh, but I think, yeah, they would have been been quite clever types of creatures. Um, In terms of weirdest, I mean, we've looked at so many weird things. I think it is even, you know, something like, like Mobasaurus, all the, the nodes on the head is, is very odd from a modern perspective, but in terms of like the entire anatomy, just not making sense, uh, the Drapanosaurs, the things like Skybalonyx, uh, probably take, take the crown, uh, just because the, the combination of these, uh, giant arms with huge claws and sort of weird looking extra bones almost in the arms, claws on the tail, these little, uh, you know, humps to the back, little bird-like heads digging and yet also maybe being up in trees. They're just bizarre animals that it's taken decades to even begin to suss out how they were living. Right. See, and I would have voted for um, our creatures today, mm-hmm. our uh, Shibuya. Yeah. Because I mean, it's, it's also those weird. little arms, they really get me. I first saw those. And I'm like, what possibly could the purpose be of those tiny, tiny little arms? Um, and real quick, I want to just give an unofficial award. I know we didn't, you know, plan to announce this, but I just want to congratulate Jackson because I think Jackson is our unofficial bingo champion. I think they've completed and won almost every single month that we've had bingo this year. So congratulations, Jackson. Thank you, Jackson. Bingo champ. And thank you everyone for joining us here. Let me get rid of our our banner there. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, I know it's been a really tough year for everybody in some way, one way or another. Um, but old news has really been a bright spot for, I know for me and Christian yeah, and hopefully for you all as well. We just have so much fun doing this and we're so glad that you join us. So um, remember that we will be back in September 
So if you would like to register to get a reminder email and get those bingo sheets and everything early, um, then you can register using the link in the description of this video. And, you know, if you want to just wait for it to pop up in your YouTube feed, you can do that as well if you're subscribed to our YouTube channel. And we hope that everyone has a great summer and, you know, check out the museum's other live programs throughout the summer while you wait for old news to come back. We've got virtual trivia Tuesdays and science tonight every Thursday night. So thank you everyone so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs> See you in the fall. Yeah see what happened over the summer and get all that mm -hmm. exciting news. Yeah, after field season is over, who knows what sort of amazing new discoveries will be coming down the pipeline. Right. Yeah. Okay, bye everyone. And thank you, Christian, of course, for sharing. Oh, no problem. <laughs>